Good morning and welcome to Alberta's Energy Future. For those that were able to join us last week, welcome back. This is the second session in the Emissions Reduction Alberta Spark Speaker Series presented in partnership with the University of Calgary. I'm Marcia Nelson, Executive Fellow in the Haskane School of Business and the School of Public Policy at the University of Calgary. And good morning. I'm Steve McDonald, CEO of Emissions Reduction Alberta. Welcome everyone. Thank you for spending time with us this morning. We are pleased to bring you the second of their, our three-part series. Last week, our keynote presentation by Kathy Bardswick and Ellen Reed reinforced the role Alberta can play as a global clean energy leader. We heard about the need for a unifying clean energy vision that creates the common ground to inspire and motivate a broader audience. Guided by this vision, we need to build on Alberta's strengths, our abundance of natural resources, our expertise in technology and engineering, and our innovative and entrepreneurial spirit. We also heard about the need to put more focus on lower carbon technologies like carbon capture and storage and hydrogen, and the need for policy and regulatory innovation that can help accelerate the adoption of these technologies. Today, we're hosting an important panel discussion on industry and technology perspectives. These experts will take a look at the solutions that will enable Alberta's economic recovery and talk about those longer term innovations that will keep us on track to meet our 2050 climate and economic goals. It's important to note we will be generating a what we heard report shaped by this panel discussion and your input afterwards. The panel discussion today will be followed by a Q&A and virtual breakout sessions. And we do hope that you'll be able to participate. This is where those creative collisions occur and we encourage you to contribute and share your perspectives. For example, last week we heard from a breakout group that connections were made to further work around low carbon fuel standards and on a potential biofuels in, uh, opportunity. These conversations are important and frankly, they're as close as we're going to get to those face-to-face -face conversations we used to have every day. It's our pleasure to introduce our panel of experts. Today, we are joined by John Mitchell, Vice President of Sustainability at Suncor, Scott Nelson, President and CEO of Titanium Corporation, Harry Vadenberg, Suncor Energy Chair and Professor at the Haskane School of Business at the University of Calgary, and Grant Strim, Chairman and CEO of Proton Technologies. Our panel moderator today is Dr. Elizabeth Cannon, former President and current Professor of Engineering at the University of Calgary. Welcome Dr. Cannon and panelists, and we're really looking forward to this important conversation. Thanks so much, Steve and Marcia, and uh, great to see uh, strong participation today and a fantastic panel. We're going to get right into the discussion. Uh, we have some questions for the panel, but that'll be followed up by Q&A. So I do encourage all participants to send us your questions. But we want to also build on some of the discussion from last week about innovative solutions in the energy sector that will help us drive a sustainable economic recovery and a lower carbon future. So I'm going to ask each of our panelists to talk about one exciting innovation that they're working on right now. And I'm going to start with Scott Nelson. Over to you, Scott. Can't hear you, Scott. Thank you. At Titanium Corporation, we believe energy is actually a strength for Alberta, and the issue is emissions. So our company, Titanium Corporation, is working on oil sands tailings to capture and uh, remediate and then recycle all the elements of oil sands tailings, preventing any emissions from getting into the atmosphere. This includes recycling lost bitumen solvents, capturing and uh, selling valuable minerals like titanium and zircon. And then the tailings are clean and can be thickened and put back in the mine. And uh, we believe that uh, a series of these types of innovations will result in, uh, in a very low carbon resource and a great reduction in, re in emissions in Alberta. Thanks so much, Scott. So over to you, Grant, about what you're working on, which is uh, really generating a lot of discussion here in Alberta and beyond. 
Sure, I'm happy to talk about it. So I agree with Scott that waste streams all need to be looked at, but I'm trying to view oil sands themselves as a different, um, a different resource than we're used to thinking of them as. When people gas up their car, um, they're, they're thinking of, well, what's actually happening is we're oxidizing fuels. And so we get oil out of the ground, process it somewhere, transport it, and then eventually oxidize it in an engine. And we're taking out a big intermediate step and actually oxidizing the resource in place. So the, the ground actually acts as a pressure vessel that it's already in and already full of essentially free and in Alberta's case, almost unlimited fuel. So in that way, we trigger hydrogen generating reactions and we have a downhole hydrogen filter that allows only the hydrogen to come through to the surface and CO2 can dissolve in bottom water, precipitate as carbonate rock. And in that way, we have geological storage over the very long term, while we can still harvest the, the energy of those formations as hydrogen. So I think this is something that is uh, underappreciated how, how big of an exporter of clean energy Alberta can be based on its resources. Great, thanks so much, Grant. And we'll come back to that in terms of uh, strategies that are being developed to position Alberta and Canada as a leader in, in hydrogen. Over to you, Harry, uh, you've got your fingers in many pies, uh, the whole spectrum of uh, energy and sustainability. What are some of the uh, innovative uh, aspects that you're working on? Okay, thanks, Elizabeth. Uh, well, I tend to, first of all, I tend to think of innovation in this space in sort of a two by two matrix, being a strategy professor. Uh, and uh, and, the, and the, the dimensions of that are uh, technical and business model and incremental and, and radical. And I'm involved, as you mentioned, with uh, all the various initiatives, including with grant with hydrogen, which would obviously be uh, radical technical innovation. But the one that I'd pick on to, to talk about right now uh, would be the uh, radical business model innovation. And there's an initiative that I've been involved with now uh, since 2018 called Project Reconciliation. And it's an initiative to purchase, uh, it's an indigenous led initiative to purchase uh, for indigenous communities of Western Canada, the Trans Mountain Pipeline and its expansion, and use uh, about 80% of the income of that pipeline for setting up an indigenous sovereign wealth fund focused on low carbon uh, infrastructure initiatives in Canada and actually around the world. Uh, and uh, it's a different way of thinking about emissions reduction than the, techn the technical reductions but it is actually very important and an important role for Canada. Canada does at the moment does not have a fund such as that. There are funds like that based in Europe that I'm sure Grant is very familiar with. I know one of them in Amsterdam has just funded Blue Earth Renewables, uh, but Canada could be a player in this space with a unique indigenous run uh, sovereign wealth fund funded by resources from our more, our more traditional uh, oil uh, resource uh, that uh, that will continue to go on for, for a number of years. But so we're essentially repurposing the uh, the natural resources wealth that Indigenous people have under their traditional territories to financial wealth in a new low carbon economy. Thanks a lot, Harry. And I think you bring up a really important point that it's not just technical innovation, it's having all of the aspects working together to really drive solutions and then put those to work. So John, um, I'll ask you to comment. Obviously, you come from a major energy player. Um, you know, your company, like many others, have made very public commitments to reducing emissions. You've been very active in driving innovation. What excites you uh, about what you see and what's happening within Suncor with respect to innovation? Sure, well, thank, thank you, Elizabeth, and uh, good morning, everyone. I think um, we've heard from each of the panelists so far, transforming the energy system is and meeting our global climate goals is gonna take these technology and innovations to scale very rapidly. And so that's gonna take, while achieving that meaningful scale is gonna take new business models, new partnerships, new financing methods, and all of those are things that we're exploring on a regular basis. And one of the ones that I'm most excited about is uh, a new partnership that we launched with uh, Lanza Tech, Mitsui, and uh, Air Nippon Airways, I always call them ANA, um, and to launch a company called Lanza Jet. And Lanza Jet is going to provide, it's an investment for us that's going to provide a solid foundation for the commercial production of sustainable aviation fuel and renewable diesel. 
And it's exciting because it has all the different parts of those uh, of that model. We have new partnerships with the partners that we've brought on board. It's a new business model, and it's one that we've used a few times before where at Suncor, we look at the number of the different technologies that are of interest to us and that we think have potential. We make an equity investment, and then we actually use our operating expertise and second people into those organizations to help scale to commercial um, to a commercial scale, those different technologies. We did that with a company called Enerchem in the past. We're doing that with Glanzajet now in their facility. And it's, it's a really exciting way for us to explore some of these new markets and these new technologies and potentially new business lines. And then when we look at the financing model that we put in place on this one, which is quite fascinating, it allows us to um, scale from demonstration to commercial very quickly because the company doesn't have to go back to another cash call when they hit different milestones. If they hit their environmental and economic and production milestones, then there's a cash call on the investment uh, that we've already made that takes them to the next phase. So again, exploring these new partnerships, exploring these new business models, and exploring these new financing methods are really, I think, what's going to help us scale a lot of these technologies really quite quickly. Great. Thanks so much, John. Um, I want to continue the conversation. We're obviously in a, a unique time uh, in, in the sense of we're dealing with a pandemic. The economy has slowed down. Uh, oil prices obviously have been under a lot of downward pressure because of that. We're, we're talking about this new normal. Given the environment that we're in right now, how has it impacted your ability to innovate? Has it, has it slowed you down? Is it, or, or has it created greater pull uh, to accelerate innovation, to look at new solutions? So maybe I'll go back to you, Scott. Uh, how has this current environment either supported what you're doing or has created additional challenges for you? Well, I think it's, it's likely done both. Uh, clearly, it's a little more complicated to do business nowadays, and we're an example of that right here. On the other hand, people are overcoming it, and uh, a lot of the things you do in innovation do involve engineers and scientists working together in one environment, and we've had to slow that down until things stabilize a bit. The other aspect is really the motivation of uh, everyone, governments, industry, the public, to see improvements and progress on the environment and on climate. And I think that is still there and it's still pretty strong. Certainly the federal government's talking about it and our provincial government is very well aware that our major industry needs to continue progress. And that's where money comes in. Obviously cash flows are way down and uh, a lot of us in this game depend on public markets and uh, obviously they're pretty well closed to these types of things at the moment. So again, uh, we're lucky in Canada, we have governments that will step up with programs to incent and help fund new innovation. And uh, those are continuing, some of them have been extended because the time frames were too short and we're expecting there will be some new stimulus coming out that will include efforts toward climate. Thanks a lot. And Grant, over to you. Uh, there's been discussion around the development of a hydrogen strategy. And uh, perhaps, you know, given the current situation, there's a, been a little bit more airtime to, to discuss some alternatives to help build capacity uh, in Canada. Could you speak to how that is impacting and perhaps supporting what you have been doing uh, here in Calgary to try to look at sort of some big opportunities to diversify the economy and build on our expertise in natural resources. Certainly. First off, I'm, I'm very happy to see Alberta coming up with a hydrogen strategy uh, at all levels in, in many provinces that's happening. And it's, uh, it, it's not just Canada. So seeing that we are uh, recognizing that there are economic ways to do clean energy is, is something that's um, some, fairly new. So, um, one thing that I don't think had been well recognized before this is that there's a, there is a possibility to make a, a very likely possibility to make hydrogen much cheaper than natural gas. And if you can do that, you have clean energy as baseload power 
And if you want wind and solar, you can still have a hydrogen turbine that you can dial up or down in order to offset that. So the, the local market um, for hydrogen can be very huge and for clean energy at low cost. And the other thing is uh, there's a, more, a, a greater recognition uh, by utilities that pipelines can actually already take 15% or so hydrogen mixed within the natural gas stream. And that doesn't cause any harm to people's appliances. So those two markets locally, even just, you know, there are definitely other uses for hydrogen that are great and, and we're already doing it, upgrading fuels, making fertilizer. Uh, but I think that there's a wider recognition that very low cost hydrogen makes a whole lot of changes. And, um, even, you know, oil will never stop. We still like to have asphalt. We still like to have uh, other consumer products that are made out of plastic and rubber and things like that. Uh, but if we can run our steam generators on hydrogen, for example, then we can do it with zero emissions. So there are, I think these, these types of uh, researches are pushing us to a much broader recognition of the potential of hydrogen. And uh, in terms of your initial question related to COVID, yes, it, it harmed our cash flow, but it, somehow I think everybody got online uh, during COVID and they're just scrolling through different headlines. And we've been around for four years, but certainly haven't had the, uh, the attention that we've had, you know, in the last six months. So it's been interesting to watch that unfold as well. Great to hear. John, I'm going to go to you. Um, clearly when oil prices go down, that impacts cash flows. And often we see with many sectors and organizations, the first thing that gets pulled back is R&D and, and innovation. How have you uh, within uh, Suncor been able to continue to drive innovation, which is a long-term goal to reduce emissions during a time when, you know, there is obviously not the same level of cash flow that there's been historically? How do you lead through that? And what are some of the opportunities and challenges you've seen? Sure. I mean, when when cash flow gets impacted in the way it does, oftentimes yes, R and D does come back. In in this circumstance, cash flow was impacted so significantly, everything came back. So it was there was um, our some of our investments in uh, low carbon energy were pulled back. Unfortunately, some of our capital investments in in our operating assets were, were pulled back. Everything was scaled back. The, the nice thing about the innovation and technology space is that the way we're structured, we have those organizations internally and they've got long-term uh, innovation agendas. And we're continuing to progress those because of the commitment to what we believe is necessary going forward, using our strengths to capitalize on opportunities of the future will only be progressed if we continue our innovation agenda and continue to bring those technologies from pilot through to demonstration through to commercialization. So um, when we've looked at our portfolio, um, we've scaled back everywhere, but we've maintained a really strong commitment to the innovations that we're trying to progress. Um, uh, you know, no, go no further than the, the example I just gave on Lanzajet where we made that commitment and made that investment about a month ago. Um, and so we're continuing to progress those things. It is important that um, we position ourselves for, some have called it build back better, some have called it a kind of resilient recovery, whatever the terminology you want to use. Um, I think where we see a real benefit through the downturn of COVID is how we're thinking about planning for the recovery. What do we, what do we want? Where do we want to put our capital? What kind of things do we want to invest in? How do we want to shape that to make sure that we have a solid base business in order for us to continue some of those investments into uh, the transformation that we want to lead through? So um, yes, challenges, but I think some real opportunities to revisit how we stack the portfolio going forward. Great. And, and Harry, over to you, building on your comments, about uh, further engaging our First Nations communities and, and really having them at the table in a significant way. Has COVID and sort of the slowdown in the oil sector given sort of time and space, if you will, to, to not just look at technical innovation, to, but to be more open to business innovation that's going to bring some of this to fruition? What, what dynamics have you seen over the last couple of months? Yeah, I think a little bit reflecting with some of the others is saying it's a little bit of both. For one thing, working with uh, 
indigenous communities as project reconciliation is uh, we're dealing with communities that are in all across Western Canada in rural Canada and in Canada there's still some of a digital divide as well so communicating in time of COVID uh, is uh, is a little bit challenged because our our mode before that was going visiting face-to-face -face in First Nations communities the indigenous leadership of project reconciliation so that's been a bit challenged but on the other hand there's a bit of an opportunity here as well. Uh, the uh, Canadian gov all Canadian governments are spending uh, fortunes on uh, on dealing with uh, with with the pandemic, uh, and uh, are looking for stimulus approaches to restart the economy. And Project Reconciliation's approach, in a sense, is something that addresses social justice for Indigenous communities, which is a big issue, um, climate through the Indigenous Sovereign Wealth Fund, and at the same time, uh, it's a stimulus in terms of getting the Trans Mountain Pipeline built, and one that, a stimulus that doesn't require uh, actually any uh, additional uh, financial input. It's made essentially getting it, uh, changing the ownership uh, to Indigenous communities, and the uh, Project Reconciliation has uh, a bid in to the, uh, the uh, proposal into the federal government to uh, finance Minister Morneau for, to acquire 51% of the Trans Mountain Pipeline. And uh, so in many ways, it's an opportunity for the federal government. And uh, we've just heard back from them that they're interested in talking. Uh, and that is expected to happen over the next uh, couple of weeks in seeing if we can get to some sort of a transaction. But it's an opportunity to address social injustice to Indigenous people, the climate issue through the Indigenous Sovereign Wealth Fund, and stimulating the economy in a, in a financially uh, uh, very efficient way for, for the government. Because this project is a commercial project and commercially financed, so it's essentially taking off the government's hands 49% of an, an asset that they currently own. Right. I think, you know, the, from the discussion last week and, and certainly from the things that our panelists have been talking about today, it's not one organization that can drive the solutions. We, we have to talk about an ecosystem and everyone coming to the table if we want Alberta to continue to lead uh, economically uh, through uh, full uh, development and appreciation of our natural resources. I'd like to throw it out to the panel to, to talk about how you see um, sort of what the big prizes are. We heard about hydrogen. We heard about some of the work you're doing in tailings ponds and reducing emissions and so on. Where does Alberta really have uh, an opportunity to, to uh, perhaps transition to new leadership opportunities? And if so, who has to be at the table to help make that happen? Who wants to jump into that one? Do you mind if I jump in? With well, I thought it was going to be you, Grant. Thanks. So uh, Proton Canada has a goal, as I've been talking publicly about, to get uh, to supply 10% of the world's energy from Alberta and, well, from Western Canada through an, a large tunnel that goes under Vancouver Island to subsea risers, which is standard oil field equipment, and housing liquefaction and terminals, or possibly a combination of floating hydrogen liquefaction and ammonia production. So... 10% um, of the world's energy by 2040 is a lot. It's almost, you know, 20% of today's energy because, you know, demand will grow across the next 20 years. But this is something that if you look at how much resource we have that can be repurposed for clean energy in the form of hydrogen directly from oil fields, uh, it's, it's, you know, definitely we have the supply to, to, uh, to do that. So that's our goal, and I think that that is something that would be transformative. We'd be a clean energy export superpower. Um, so all of a sudden, you don't have to worry about the the whales in these little uh, near the Gulf Islands and things like that. If you if you go out further from the mammal habitat, so um, you know there's no reason to have environmental. It's not environmentally controversial to be exporting a clean energy product at large scale in a way that doesn't disturb the local. On the coast, so that's the big prize I see. Elizabeth, so, I so, can... yeah, go ahead because Harry, maybe you could build on that. I mean, uh, it's a, obviously hugely visionary, hugely impactful. Uh, but we know some of these very large capital projects have been very difficult to execute in Canada. So, Harry, maybe you can build on some of Grant's uh, comments. 
Yeah, maybe I could just, to, to me, one of the biggest challenges is sort of the perceptions. And Grant is familiar with this as well, because I'm, I'm involved, I'm on, on his board, that uh, when you start talking about hydrogen, hydrogen's great, clean hydrogen great. If it's made from renewables, both of it, if it comes from Alberta, oil and gas, well, I'm not so sure I'm interested in that. And the same thing for the Indigenous Sovereign Wealth Fund that's focused on low carbon infrastructure, Canada and worldwide, oh, but it's also associated with oil from Alberta. Oh, so that's not so good. And it's, it's one of the things that we really have to find a way to overcome. Because we're sitting here in the last session as well, talking about all kinds of cool, innovative things happening. But the pushback that often comes back is the history, oh, it's Alberta and it's oil. And that's a huge challenge to overcome. And I know with hydrogen, it's an issue. It's an issue with the Indigenous Sovereign Wealth Fund. Uh, and I'm sure the others can speak to that as well. And I, it's not entirely clear to me how we do that. We're struggling with that. And I think with Project Reconciliation, we're, we're making some headway with that. And I think uh, in the hydrogen space as well. But it is a challenge for, for Alberta coming from its history of oil and oil sands, or as often called tar sands. That's what we're still dealing with, no matter what you do with it. So maybe, John, over to you. Um, you know, there are many players in the ecosystem, the private sector, obviously academia, uh, government, you've had other organizations like COSIA, uh, CRIN, the Clean Resource Innovation Network, which the federal government's investing $100 million specifically to help drive innovation and to create pathways for companies, often small startup companies who are innovating, connect through to be able to uh, build connections to the receptor capacity to have their technology actually being deployed. So from your perspective, what do you see as sort of the, the big prizes and, and who has to be at the table to really make sure that we capitalize on them? I think, I think you've, you've, hit, um, you've hit on a lot of really um, excellent strengths that Alberta has already. When I look at the ecosystem, we do have, we do have the collaboration capacity in things like CRIN and COSIA. Um, and, and, why, and why that's important is, I think the sector, the oil and gas sector specifically, the approach to innovation is really changing and has really changed over the last number, number of years. And we're not all the way there yet, but I think it's, it's improving all the time. And we're going from a culture of very much, these are my problems, these are unique to me, and nobody, can, nobody else knows how to solve them but the experts we have within the organization. And that's changing. And that's changing to a much more externally focused innovation model where we are going outside of the walls of our organizations to seek solutions, to seek new partnerships, to seek good ideas from elsewhere. And I think vehicles like CRIN, like COSIA, you think about some of the work that Alberta Innovates is doing, the, um, and on some of the uh, other types of innovations on how we think of the future and how we unfold some of those opportunities, things like the Energy Futures Lab, the, the ecosystem around ideas and this type of conversation in Alberta is so, is so much stronger now than it has been in the past. It's allowing these um, concepts to sort of see the light of day, whether that's hydrogen, whether that's carbon capture use and storage or utilization and storage, depending on the vernacular of the day, um, or bitumen beyond combustion. I think what we're looking at now are the strengths that the sector has and, the, and what we can build on to decarbonize the future. Um, I mean, we're, we're really excited about some of the biofuel opportunities that, we, that we've got. We think that there's some real potential in Alberta Innovates with the uh, Bitchman Beyond Combustion work. There's some excellent work going on with XPRIZE and carbon capture use and storage. So I think all the building blocks are there. What we need to do is make sure we've got a, the, the companies and the um, economy that has got us to where we are today, we reinforce that foundation so that we can have the capital and the cash flow to invest in a lot of these opportunities in the future. Great. Before I turn it over to you, Scott, uh, just uh, encourage uh, folks um, who are online to submit their questions in the Q&A panel. I see some are starting to come in, but uh, we'll be opening it up very shortly to your questions to our panel members. But before we do that, Scott, maybe you could talk about the prize. I mean, you know, what you're working on is hugely transformative, but I know you've been working at it for a long time. It's hugely capital intensive. Um, what do you see 
that needs to be done to bring your technology into full production so the benefits can be realized for Alberta and beyond? Uh, thanks, Elizabeth. Um, you're right. Uh, developing new transformative technologies for any large industry, particularly something like oil sands, is a very long uh, process and it requires a lot of money. We've invested over $100 million in our technologies. We're now at the engineering stage, uh, looking at our first project at uh, Canadian Naturals Horizon site but it's a technology that is designed for the entire industry and all of their uh, tailings areas. But uh, so it's a big prize. Uh, diversification is important in all of these things. And I think you've heard a bit about that. If we can diversify with hydrogen and uh, some products like uh, clean jet fuel and so on. In this case, it's uh, valuable minerals, titanium and zircon for export markets. So there's a lot of those types of opportunities, uh, products beyond bitumen. And uh, it's, it's really not any one thing. I think it will be a combination of uh, efforts such, that, such as uh, John described that are going to result in a very large overall prize made up of many, many different uh, components. And the good news is uh, Albertans have turned their mind to that We've got a lot of smart people, a lot of smart institutions like uh, U of C, a lot of good scientists, and, uh, and we have uh, in Canada governments that are willing to invest and support us as we do that. So uh, I think most of us in this game are pretty optimistic. We sort of have to tune out the noise from the, uh, you know, the anti-oil sands type folks. And I think the, uh, the answer to that is we'll just show them that we can be a very clean resource and the one that's much needed in the world. Great, thank you very much. I'm going to turn to some of the questions that have been submitted and have been a number to follow up on your comments, Grant, in, in hydrogen, uh, but really differentiating um, perhaps a, a label. And, and one of the questions is, we need to, as Albertans and Canadians, push back on this sort of green hydrogen label that's coming out of particularly Germany was used as an example so that, um, that the comments that the panelists made around, okay, we can produce hydrogen, but again, it's coming from Alberta, that's not the hydrogen we want. Could you maybe speak to that grant? You know, it's not just, again, the technology, it's how it's positioned in the marketplace relative to other jurisdictions. Yes, I think there's always going to be a pushback on blue hydrogen, and it's not just Germany, Australia, it's very contentious right now. Um, should we be building blue hydrogen versus green, uh, basically emissions free? And so the, the, that is the big differentiating factor. So with, with blue hydrogen, they do steam methane reforming in the standard way and try and capture as much of the emissions as possible. But it's very difficult to capture more than, I've seen numbers like 40% 40 40 of emissions instead of 100% or even maybe 25% of emissions. But there's still a lot of emissions given that on an energy basis, SMR uh, gives you hydrogen with an emissions profile very similar to coal. So um, there is a, you know, if you build out that direction, it is inexpensive relatively to, relative to some other directions, but it still is emissions intensive. Um, green hydrogen is anything that's zero emissions. It's most typically associated with uh, wind, solar, hydroelectricity directly to electrolysis. But it's also, you know, in California has a green uh, garbage gasification project. So if there is zero, zero emissions, it's green. So that's the big, that's one of the, I think, competitive advantages that Proton uh, can bring to our economy here is that we'll be not only in the near term, but in the long term, helping enable an emissions free hydrogen uh, production process. And is that and all part could... of the Alberta strategy, maybe? Uh, I don't know if you, Grant, or someone else wants to speak to the Alberta strategy. Um, and also, there was a question on the retrofit of pipelines. Can existing pipelines uh, take hydrogen? Is that technically feasible? Elizabeth, maybe I could pick up on the Alberta strategy here. I think you froze, Harry. Um, I think we'll move on to another question. Oh, go ahead, Harry. I think you're back. 
Oh, okay. Um, the, the difference is zero carbon. Some of the definitions of green hydrogen are associated with where it comes from. Does it come from renewables or from hydrocarbons? And the challenge for Alberta's and for Proton is to communicate that it's really about zero carbon emissions. That's what it's about. It's not where, whether it comes from uh, hydrocarbons or it comes from, uh, from renewable energy. And that is a bit of a challenge because a number of the definitions of uh, green is that it doesn't come from hydrocarbons, it comes from renewables. So that is something that I think we need to work on in communicating that so that Alberta does not get disadvantaged. Okay. Great. In terms uh, of the hydrogen strategy, sorry, just real quick, the, the, uh, there is more of a focus on blue hydrogen, which is a good transition, transition step. Alberta does a lot of steam reforming and, and very well and some of the lowest cost worldwide. So expanding on that and building out the infrastructure, I think is going to serve us well as an industry for several reasons. But um, it's something that uh, in the, the longer term, there will always be environmental pushback against even blue hydrogen. John, I'm gonna just over to you. If you wanna A, follow up on that, but also um, maybe speak to CCUS um, you know, there have been a, several years ago, a lot of discussion on that. It kind of went a bit quiet. Now it's coming back. Could you give us an update on what's happening in that area? Uh, sure. Maybe I'll touch on a couple that I've seen uh, come through here and just, just building um, on Grant's point. I think one of the, other, one of the things, if, if a theme of what we're trying to accomplish in Alberta is to take the strengths that we've got and build into some of these uh, low carbon growth opportunities in the future, um, hydrogen, we do, we know how to work with hydrogen in this province. We work with a lot of it. We use a lot of it. We're a big market for it. So we've got the skill sets in the province to scale uh, hydrogen technology. So if we're looking for things where we have strength, that has the potential to be an op opportunity. And so it, it, th that's a good example of where do we build on what we have to get to where we uh, want to go to capture some of these opportunities. And that gets to another couple of the questions that were in there. One um, on the uh, sustainable aviation fuel side, you know, what's the potential for that? Um, well, that's, that's a little bit of what we're hoping to explore with uh, our investments is when, when we look at, you know, obviously the aviation industry has been hugely impacted by, by COVID and is going to take a long time to recover from it. But when they, when they begin their recovery, um, as a fuel provider, we're looking for growth opportunities to help our customers manage their own emissions and sustainable aviation fuel is a, is a potentially a way to do that. And with the airlines commitments to um, offsetting and, and reducing their own emissions, we think that there's a big market there. We're not exactly sure how uh, large that will be, but we think there's some opportunity. Um, and that's what we'll be looking at when we, when we look at where to place that commercial facility in the future, provided all the hurdles get met. So, so that was another question that had come up in the, in the chat. There was, um, you'd ask specifically about CC US, Elizabeth, and there's a, there is still um, a lot of interest in CC US. I think the size and scale of the capital required in, to do a lot of CC US is still challenging. Um, I think things like COSIA's X Prize and some of the work that's going on um, in that arena will be helpful. Um, but that's still going to be a big challenge for CCUS is to, is to get over the capital, uh, the intense capital um, requirements to, to deliver that, particularly as we get through um, this phase of recovery where companies are going to begin to repair their balance sheets as well. It'll, um, I think we need to uh, look at some of the demonstration facilities and the XPRIZE um, work to advance and hopefully bring down some of those costs because it'll be a little bit challenging through the future. And if I could, maybe I just I just pick up on one more one more question that came up because I see there's a, there's lots coming in now, so we all just uh, jump into one more. There's one of the there was a question around how do we what what could governments do to help um, get innovation rolling and and what could what role could they play? And one of the one of the challenges that we've got as a large organization that spends a lot of money building projects and is a big market for clean innovation where we can deploy a number of these different technologies is we have a very challenging regulatory structure to navigate and system to navigate. Um, for example, if we, if we wanna, we're in the process now of trying to set up a, an approval for something that we need to come on stream or we would want to come on stream in the early 2030s. We've already engaged in a regulatory process because it's going to take that long to get through it. 
well, how do you innovate and introduce new innovations that are still making their way through pilot demonstration and commercialization when you're into a 10 to 13 year regulatory process? You then have to go back to the start to introduce and change design specs. It becomes very challenging. So we've got to figure out in the country a way to have a more nimble regulatory system so that we can introduce some of these innovations to things that are very long lead. Great. And Scott, I'm going to ask that question to you. Um, you're in the technology uh, development uh, phase. From your perspective, what do you feel governments can do? John talked about the regulatory side. Is that one of the barriers for you or is it more capital investment? No, it's uh, regulatory fortunately is not uh, that significant because we're on existing sites and we don't impact um, in, you know anything beyond those sites so it's it's a little easier to uh, get through that process you know the big challenge in uh, i think in canada in general is financing and funding uh, this type of work it's uh, you know it's high risk particularly at the early stages uh, you're looking at uh, a number of years before you're going to be generating returns and as i mentioned before it, it requires a lot of uh, a lot of uh, resources and investment to get these uh, technologies through the full cycle. And uh, what we do have is very good cooperation from the industry, but uh, these are entrepreneurial uh, ventures and uh, we don't expect the industry to pay for them all. They can be a partner. So that's where financial markets and government come in. And we certainly need a better system in Canada that invests in innovation, new technologies, that invests in uh, climate. It's, it's there in Europe and other parts of the world. And uh, they, are, they would take a bit of risk and they would have the uh, benefits of this emerging uh, totally new area. But I think we're behind and uh, governments are doing a pretty good job of supporting us on the innovation side with grants uh, there's little or no financing, and there needs to be. And uh, as John said, we need to get to a better place from an economic climate point of view in Canada to uh, really restart a lot of this work and uh, get it through to completion. Uh, Harry, I want to move over to you. There's some questions on um, how do you balance investing in innovation or adopting innovation, uh, A, to drive down emissions, but B, to create more efficient operations, drive down costs in the current COVID environment where, you know, many companies, particularly the energy sector, are worried about, um, you know, paying the bills this week and next. How, how do you, from an ecosystem perspective, your strategy professor, how do we as a, as a community and an ecosystem tackle that? Um, well, one thing, the, the fortunate thing is that reducing emissions is actually uh, correlates almost pr uh, precisely with reducing costs as well. And I think that's what the industry has been focused on and I think will continue to focus on. I recently uh, published uh, two co-authored papers, one in the Journal of Cleaner Production and the other in Energy Journal, that showed that uh, Alberta oil companies, oil sands companies are in fact reducing their emissions and reducing their costs. And these are peer reviewed studies. And I believe, and, and probably John is better positioned to comment on the details of this, but that will go on. And it's not inconsistent. Reducing emissions is not at all inconsistent with reducing costs. Now that's in the longer run. That's not necessarily cutting costs in the immediate future, to, uh, immediate uh, uh, time frame to deal with COVID, but in in the longer haul, that is exactly where it's going to. And in terms of um, the oil market, we're probably not going to see hundred dollar oil again anywhere if, if ever. Uh, so uh, reducing costs is something that uh, all companies are are looking at and are working very hard on. And again, they're, they're, they correlate with with reducing emissions. Mm -hmm. John, a question has come in uh, regarding. Moving beyond energy, I mean, obviously, you know, Suncor, you are an energy company, but uh, looking at other technologies related to materials for energy, uh, materials for batteries and other things. There was a question earlier around upgrading, um, sort, of, sort of moving a little bit more downstream. Could you maybe comment on, you know, where there are opportunities? Is it, is it something that Alberta should be looking at? Uh, with respect to, again, harnessing our know-how and, uh, and our natural resources? 
Sure, and I, th I think we've got, when I think about it from Suncor's perspective on, you know, when we look at the energy system transformation, what is it, how are we gonna plan it and what are, what are our rules? And I mean, it starts with making sure that our base business is operating uh, at low carbon and cost effectively. So that kind of carbon productivity for the emissions and the, that we produce, are we being as, um, are we producing as few of them as we can and efficiently as we can and reducing the cost associated with what we do as a base business. That's sort of job number one, because that provides cash flow and allows us to explore other alternatives. The second category is really this sort of low carbon profitability. Where, where are the opportunities in the future that where we see opportunities for new business lines, whether that's um, in a bitumen beyond combustion, sort of a carbon fiber space, that could be in a hydrogen space, that could be in a biofuel space, could be in a material space. I mean, when we think about even the refining we do now, um, everybody knows about the fuels that we produce, but we produce a, a ton of asphalt. So technically not, a, not an emitting source, but that's really not um, a big step to go from producing asphalt or carbon black into tr transforming that into other commodities, other things. So again, we've got the strength to do that. There's, a, there's another part of what we do, which is helping the customers that we serve manage their, their emissions. So that customer connection um, we're in a, a fortunate space as Suncor with our Petro Canada brand, where we're interacting, at least pre-COVID, with a you know a million and a half Canadians every day. And so, what are we doing there to help tackle the emissions challenges, whether that's EV charging or whatever that happens to be? And then there's a then there's sort of an energy transformation leadership where you're thinking about what's the portfolio of new technologies that I want to begin to harvest and grow so that we've got um, optionality in the future and what are the policy environments that we need in order to make those successful. So the question around, is there opportunity there? Absolutely. And I think we've got some really strong organizations in the province that are exploring those like Alberta Innovates and they do an excellent job of partnering with companies who have some of the internal skill sets and the resources to dedicate towards that. So um, long answer to say, um, very briefly that yes, there is opportunities for diversification, but that needs to come from a very strong base of what, what got us to where Alberta is today. Well, I'm going to throw in a question because I come from uh, the academic community and it's really around talent. I mean, one of the things we want to ensure in Alberta is that our young people coming out of our post-secondary institutions are excited about joining and contributing to uh, the energy sector and innovation within the sector. Um, we see programs like the Creative Destruction Lab at the Haskell School, which has a clean energy stream, where you have startups uh, looking at development of new technology, being mentored by people from the industry as to how they can bring again their technologies forward, get them deployed. Uh, but this to me is really important. If we're going to, for the long term, have an innovative sector, we need to make sure our young people are excited about joining it. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll ask who in the panel would like to, but maybe I'm going to look at you, Harry, because you come from the academic environment. What do we need to do in Alberta to make sure our, our talent stays here and that they're contributors to some of these big opportunities that are in front of us? Well, I can just in sense uh, reflect what you're saying that both at the Haskins School of Business and at the School of Public Policy, where I also teach, uh, there's only one thing that excites MBA and MP Masters of Public Policy students, and that is clean energy and moving uh, towards uh, a cleaner, low carbon uh, economy. Uh, there's very little interest in the traditional uh, oil industry. Uh, and that doesn't mean that they're not interested in getting jobs with oil companies, but what, what, gets, what gets them excited is being part of the solution to moving to a lower carbon economy. And that goes across the board. That's where the interest is. Yeah, absolutely. Grant, a, a great question came in about uh, other jurisdictions that are leading the way in sustainable hydrocarbon development. You know, from your work, uh, and I know when we chatted earlier, you've referred to other jurisdictions that are very proactive. They see, particularly in hydrogen, a huge opportunity. Where can Alberta, what can Alberta learn and from whom? So I think this, this question also ties to your prior question about engaging young population of unemployed people and students and all this. Um, in Canada, we don't have a good history of these unicorn companies. If people want to grow, 
they keep saying no, 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 no. And suddenly they go to California and Uber is born there, even though it was born in Calgary. That's one of many, many examples where we just don't have this um, portfolio investment strategy in our mindset where in Canada, there's a zero risk investment uh, strategy that dominates. And I think that that uh, has a very strong and negative influence on um, people's perceptions of what they can do. I think that a Canadian business right now who gets into any type of hydrogen valve or widgets or whatever is likely to be a very successful startup company and something that supports this whole global push and pull towards clean, clean hydrogen uh, solutions. But that's not well, um, you, you don't see a lot of those examples coming from Canada, you know, but I, I think that that's partly because of this, this systemic zero risk investment, which avoids uh, portfolios that have any element of risk. And um, it's more like exploration where what one, one or two does really well and pays for the duds. We don't really do that in Canada. And so um, that ends up with uh, companies like mine who get phone calls from Australia on a very regular basis or from Germany or from these other places, Norway, Japan, uh, even South Korea that are saying, we are doing everything hydrogen. We have huge budgets and huge teams and it's a lot of fun, come here. You know, for example, Ballard has, has several thousand buses running on hydrogen wo worldwide and zero running on hydrogen in Canada. Um, that's just a, you know, a, a microcosm or a metaphor for there's something wrong with how we're doing it. Um, so am I seeing enormous uh, pull internationally? Yes, South America, you know, the, the whole world is pushing aggressively towards hydrogen. And I think that there's a, a too big of a belief that things will be this, the way that they have been in our energy mix um, within Canada. And it's going to be forcibly shut down whether we like it or not to some large extent whether that's through increase, incrementally increased carbon taxes or other punitive measures, or whether it's just the economic incentive of consumers who would rather go to one of Petro Canada's 1800 gas stations than go to the pump that has hydrogen and pay a lot less than they pay for diesel and gasoline. Great, Grant, I think um, excellent comments and a, a very strong reminder that um, hydrogen is, is an opportunity. Strategies are being developed, but they have to be executed if Canada wants to take a lead and, and realize uh, the upside potential. I think with that, um, we're getting close to the top of the hour and I want to uh, provide an opportunity for all our panelists to take a quick minute with some final comments. You may want to build on some of the discussion we had already or provide a new perspective. And Scott, I'm going to turn to you first. Thank you, Elizabeth. And thank you, uh, the University of Calgary and ERA. Uh, ERA has been one of our strongest supporters. We should, uh, we should mention that and continuing supporters. Um, I think what we heard today is uh, there's multiple routes to success in, uh, in Alberta in creating a, uh, a lower carbon future. Uh, we should anchor it on the strength of the industry we already have, and we should be supporting that industry as they work toward creating a much lower carbon footprint for our products, which most of us believe are going to be needed for decades ahead. At the same time, we're developing, you know, new alternatives and energy companies are involved in those. And uh, behind all that are the innovators, some of them within the large energy companies, but a lot of them in the entrepreneurial sector. And we need to support them in Canada we need to foster them. This is the future for our children and, uh, and our institutions to some degree. So uh, we need to keep uh, the conversation going around all this. This has been a good start and uh, make sure that uh, Canada is seen as an emerging leader in this area and not a follower. Thanks very much. I'm going to uh, reverse and, and I'll go to you, Grant, then Harry, and then John to, to finalize. So Grant, uh, final comments. Well, final comments. I'm, I'm delighted to have been invited as a guest. Um, sometimes I'm polarizing. I have strong opinions and I'm strongly optimistic about our clean energy future. Um, but to, to be able to give some uh, 
view on sort of the rationale of why I feel this way. It's, it's an honor to be your guest uh, invited here and thank you for that. We have a very strong hydrogen future as Western Canada and uh, I'm excited to watch it uh, build as, as the years roll by. Great, well lots of interest in hydrogen today for sure and I'm sure it'll follow up in the breakout sessions. Uh, Harry, over to you. Um, I noticed some of the questions are also asking about uh, government's role. And I refer to a, a, an op-ed article I wrote in the Globe and Mail about six months ago. And I said, the enemy is not Alberta and it's not the oil industry, but it's emissions that we should be focused on. And I would like to see our government leaders and business leaders focus on that. That's what we're really talking about. There's been too much focus on Alberta as the problem or the industry as the problem. Uh, and what we're hearing here today uh, is there are lots of solutions. There's lots of innovation going on. And let's focus on moving to a low carbon economy. And it doesn't necessarily mean that Canada should shut down its industry and, and turn its back on its wealth of, uh, of natural resources. And I think that's where... The politicians are, are sometimes not getting it right. There's a strong pressure to you know, shut down oil, shut down pipelines, shut down anything to do. And that is not the way forward. The way forward is what we're hearing today is reduce, reducing emissions in various ways. Well, and I think it's an excellent point. I know uh, oil sands producers, uh, Suncor included, have reduced emissions by 30% since, what, 2012, I believe. Um, so it is happening and it's through innovation and commitment Sometimes that message, uh, even if it's being communicated, is, is not being heard or sufficiently heard or if it's sufficiently appreciated. But over to you, John, for some final remarks uh, from our panel. Sure, I, I, I think the conversation has been great. I think there's been some really nice closing elements. Um, when we look at the last few months, um, obviously COVID and our response to it, it's, it's shaken the foundations of our economy and it's shaken the foundations of economies around the world. Um, but one of the things that has shown us is that we can come together. I mean, I look at the animosity that was present um, between governments six months ago, eight months ago. Um, we can, when motivated, come together and break down some of those barriers. And I've, we've seen a real rallying of our governments to the crisis, the working together. It hasn't been perfect, but I think it's been a lot better than it was prior to that. So when we're motivated, whether it's companies or whether it's others, we can come together to um, bring all of what has created the prosperity and the, and the nation that we know today. We can reinforce the foundation that has, that has built that uh, prosperity. And we can look at what opportunities we want to capture to thrive in this low carbon economy of the future. And I think building on those strengths that we've got will position us really well. And we're, we don't have a lot of time to do that. We have to do this very quickly. We're about to enter into one of the largest global competitions for capital that we've seen in recent memory. And if we don't get our act together and make sure that we're positioning ourselves as a nation to attract that dollar back to this country, we're gonna miss some of these opportunities that we're so set up to capture. And so um, we need to move and we need to move quickly on this.